Hi, hello, everybody. Good evening to yet another show of Zena Star Salon, the chat show with me, your host, Kapil Dev, the season two and the episode three with Dr. CM Nautial, Chandra Mohan Nautial, a renowned academician, a physicist, a research scholar, an author, uh, a publication guru, a speaker, an advocator of science and technology. And he wears many, many hats, or uh, many feathers on the hat. And uh, by the way, he's also sung us a wonderful song to lighten up the mood before the show has begun. And we have so much to talk to him uh, today about science, technology, uh, Mother Nature, Earth, the speaker that he is, uh, uh, the renowned personality that he is, and also an avid sports enthusiast. So let's get chatting with Dr. Chandra Mohan. Nautial. So, sir, uh, before we get to show, uh, are you somewhere related to Jubin Nautial, the singer? <laughs> no, in no way. <laughs> so, you say the same uh, sure name. So, I was just wondering if you are uh, connected with him. So, so you uh, you had your uh, uh, first class education in uh, Masters in Physics from, uh, from Merritt. And also, you have your... Uh, um, IIT Roorkee background with your PhD from, uh, from IIT Roorkee. And no, then of no, course... I, I did my uh, BSc honors from Bayer, right. MSc from Roorkee, Root. uh, which at that time was known as University of Roorkee. Now this is Root. known as IIT. And uh, my doctoral and postdoctoral work was at Physical Research Laboratory in Java. So, of all your whole uh, uh, um, profile, I was engaging to understand. Uh, you have cracked it uh, at the biggest level and uh, you took an interest towards carbon dating and archaeology. Uh, what interested you about archaeology? Uh, per se, it was not the archaeology which attracted me first. Uh, when I was at PRL and the bar, we did have a carbon 14 lab, but I was not really deeply involved in that. But my interest was isotopes and that too measuring them by metrometry. It was only later after I came to uh, Birba Sahani Institute of Value Botany, as it was known then, uh, I, I took interest in radiocarbon dating here. And uh, later, uh, the spectrum of activities of the Institute uh, went on increasing. And it was even renamed at Birba Sahani Institute of Value Science. Because now it was not just the botany uh, or bo paleo botany uh, scientists who were working here. We had physicists, geologists, and others. So radiocarbon dating made use of my expertise in the isotopes. As you know, that radiocarbon is a result of production of cosmic rays bombarding the atom. Earlier, so, I was... Uh, yeah. I'm a little inquisitive to ask this question about the, car the, the carbon dating and uh, analyzing the rock, uh, archaeological rocks, and, and telling to which monolithic or mesolithic all these terms which i don't understand uh, uh, so much just put a light on uh, onto it there's this uh, recent traces about uh, 30000 years old civilization bimbikta if i'm not getting getting it correct from madhya pradesh where the first of the human uh, civilizations is is said to have begun uh, from madhya pradesh is it true uh, please uh, if uh, you have any information there is about a, it. there is a place by name bimbikta in madhya pradesh yeah. And that is where you see a lot of cave paintings. In fact, in almost every state of India, you have cave painting, uh, what we call Shaila Chitra. The early human beings, they were living in the jungle, in the forest, and they went to these places for shelter. And using some of the readily available material like iru, uh, red ochre, yellow ochre, and sometimes they even crushed the stones to make colors. Sometimes they use the vegetable colors like turmeric and all, or even calcium uh, carbonate or calcium oxide. They use these materials to make paintings on the wall. Now, unfortunately, in case of India, the actual physical dating of these paintings is very, very limited. Very limited. Uh, so, it's very difficult to say whether these paintings were done 30,000 years or when. Uh, we have some paintings in Europe and uh, they have been dating to, they have been dated to be about 
30,000 years. Uh, there are some which are claimed to be 65,000 years. So outside we have dated uh, those paintings, but in India we have very few uh, paintings which have been dated, just as two places. Uh, one is uh, uh, in Mirzapur. Uh, there is a oh. place where uh, um, a painting was dated. It turned out to be about 12 or 13,000 years. And it was not done in India. It was done at the Bristol University. There is uh, another place in Antra uh, where uh, there was an etching kind of thing, engraving, inside which some material was filled. And it was dated to be about 5,000. These are the only two places in the country, to the best of my knowledge, where these rock art has been dated. Uh, so I think uh, saying that uh, Bhimbetka has uh, 30,000 year old painting, more of a guess rather than actual. So, uh, of course, India being the oldest of the civilization has its own traces and you know, we always keep saying that we are 10,000 years old civilization Then now this, the recent Bimbitka, which is 30,000 years is, is as claimed by the, uh, by the art form that is being engaged with. Any other uh, closer civilizations uh, of, of cave art or archaeological art like in India, does, uh, does you know, South America have the same connect uh, with uh, the... the Actually, uh, as I was saying, that in India, in almost every state, we have rock. Uh, in UP, if you uh, talk of uh, Mirzapur and then south of Banaras area, like uh, Sonbhadra, oh. here, Allahabad, uh, then there is there are some other districts like Chandoli and Mirzapur, Sonbhadra. These are places uh, where you see uh, rock art. Outside also you have rock art. And in most of the cases, whether it's in South America or it's in Spain or it's in, in any other country or in India, most of the time the figures that have been drawn by people are of more or less the same art. Because you know that the early men were hunter and hunters right. and uh, gatherers. So what they did was uh, they used to encounter animals. Most of the time the paintings, for example, I have been uh, extensively to the Eastern to Mirzapur, uh, and uh, to Bali, and I have also been to Bhimbetka twice. So I have also observed, and others have also seen that most of the time these paintings are of animals. These paintings are of uh, people hunting. These are paintings about people at war, they're battling. Uh, there are some strange animals also seen, like giraffe, but we know that we don't have giraffe in this part. Or the natural method, like it was imagination. So on one hand, we uh, say that the that uh, these are reflections of the early uh, reality. On one hand, we say that, but at the same time, we also know that there is also a mix of imagination in these drawings. So everything that has been drawn by these early people is not actually. Well, uh, they must have made some imagination because in Eastern UP, at some places, you find objects drawn. They look like aliens. They have oh. a helmet and all. Uh, but I think that is all imagination. Uh, so most of the time, they have drawn deer. They have drawn horses. They have drawn uh, buffaloes. They have drawn uh, people with the, who are shooting with bow and arrow and so on that people dancing, people involved in rituals, people uh, in daily life activity. And uh, more or less you find uh, similar objects being painted by people in South America or Spain or France or elsewhere. There, the scientific base is much stronger. For example, uh, two rhinoceros, two rhinos okay. have been painted with charcoal uh, in one place in uh, France. And they have been dated to be about 30,000 years. There are some other paintings. There is one uh, painting where a lot of people are, a lot of uh, figures are there. And this has been dated to be about 65,000. Okay. So there's, oh. there's a lot of ancientness towards a lot of the art and the similarities, of course. And coming from the ancient uh, technologies to, to that of uh, the evolution of it into science and then into technology in the more, more, more recent age, which you as an advocate uh, and professor of practice 
do speak about science and science uh, utility of science in, in, in today's world. Uh, with all your experiences in, in various research publications, over 130 that you've put across on various subject matter expertises, um, and you also had the expert had the had the privilege to work with Baba Atomic Research Center from in your words. Uh, no, I was a physical assistant. All right. So I, my I my guide going. was my uh, professor. Mm -hmm. He had been at Baba Atomic. Wow. So uh, India has taken a long strides uh, in terms of uh, it's in a post independence time, developing of the IITs and the science centers. In my city of Hyderabad, there's a lot of these science centers here, and I live in one of those centers uh, close by. Um, how do you see the evolution of science in India? Uh, I would still say that uh, the early period of 20th century was the period of renaissance in Paiskal. That was time when we had Vishan Bose, we had Asan Bose, then we had Meghna Saha, uh, just before that, we had P.C. Ray, we had Birbal Sahani. So if you really ask me, uh, 1930s, 1940s, 1940s, that was a real golden period as far as Indian science. Post-independence, oh. post-independence, we have built up a lot of history. Earlier, science was not so much institutional. People okay. were working out of their passion. They were working passion. with their own resources. For example, uh, C.V. Raman. C.V. Raman was uh, employed at a very senior government officer in the financial services in the British period. It was purely out of his interest in science. He noticed while traveling to his work that there is something called uh, one uh, institution for advancement of science, Kolkata. He noticed it. So while returning, he got down there and then find out about the institution. And next few years, he would regularly go there after returning from the office, work there till oh. late in the night, and then come there early morning, maybe five o'clock or six o'clock, then again work there, and then go for two days. So, so that's in no those commitment days, for that. That was a commitment. Similarly, people like uh, Jagdish and Bose or SN Bose, uh, Meghna Saha, they were very, very intelligent, creative people. So I don't think we have touched those, those levels or that level. Uh, now. But one thing is true that we have built a lot of institutions. Before independence, the Britishers had no interest developing the intellectual country. After independence, uh, institutions like Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, it was built. Uh, then we had uh, another Tata Institute, which is now known as Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Right. We have several institutions in Kolkata, which have been built up like houses. Uh, we have almost, uh, you go to any uh, metro city in the country, a lot of institutions. So it itself boasts of uh, about a uh, dozen research institutes, four of CSIR, one of DST, several of ICAR, and so on. We have built up a lot of institutions. The number of papers, I think we are at number three or four in the world. And uh, as some people, that very soon we may be at the top. But I asked one very senior scientist uh, who had uh, been a secretary position in the government, science, and he said that yes, he may be soon getting to number one as number of papers is concerned. I asked him what about the quality. He said I am not sure that whether we would be number one. We at present we have uh, USA ahead of us. We have China ahead of us. Uh, but India is. Important. India is improving definitely in the uh, in terms of number of publications. I think we have to also catch up. So, I mean, of course, uh, USA being uh, the number one country in the world with better university infrastructure and facilities and research and development being one of the priorities, uh, biggest priority for them to exercise. And that's how the whole innovation structure has evolved with America dominating the whole world markets with the product line and the whole the structure line. Um, do you see that uh, 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 that change transcending to India now that our, our university is more competent to have research and development cells within the campuses, A, and uh, uh, B, uh, 
what is the kind of support structure that the state governments and central governments are exhibiting in developing? Uh, you've been part of the DST and uh, and the support of the incubation programs and the cells, um, which which are blatantly needed to set up uh, research and innovation and development. Um, how is the whole scene right now with the Indian academia? Uh, see, I was earlier working with an institution of is when at Ahmedabad, I was doing my PhD in postdoc. Later, I was working at an institute, which is uh, an autonomous institution of the Department of Science. Now, uh, if you really look at this, uh, earlier we were spending approximately 0.8, of the GDP on science and technology. At present, I think it's somewhere close to 0 0.6. This is nowhere close to uh, which you see in many of the countries where people are spending as much as 3% or 4% of the GDP science and technology. Even though our GDP is pretty high compared to many other countries, so in, in terms of absolute amount, we are still in the top few. But I think uh, the, the same stuff has to be distributed among 1.4 billion people. Let's put it so We are nowhere at the top. We have to pump in more money. The one, one main reason uh, which causes its difference is that in USA industry is a big partner in research right. uh, in science and technology. Whereas in our country, uh, there is very little uh, input to the S and, and S and efforts by the industry. I think this is where improvement has to be made because no country, including the United States, pumps in all of its money uh, from the government industry. But here, the, the uh, research is also oriented that we have to make a good balance between basic sciences and the applied science. Science, so, sciences, so industry. That, uh, in, in America or in the Western world, industry does support the academic interest in developing the research and development. In India, you see that as a gap that industry, more and more industry has to come forward to support the uh, the academic uh, research interest and development. Like, you know, if I if I could get it right, uh, uh, the latest, all these social media jargons that we see right now, it could be Google, it could be Facebook, it could be of many of these, including um, all the laboratories uh, which have built up uh, the, the software technologies are all university incubated projects. Actually, in as uh, we just discussed, in US uh, industry is a big part of the science. In case of our country, there is very little activity going on. Even though now, um, I think they should make it mandatory that certain percentage of the profit uh, they must put into the research, the academics back in, in R and D. Uh, and in that case, I think their basic interest will be to bring out products it's sold. Uh, in U.S., this is what happens. In fact, in U.S., whatever money is put in by the uh, American government into NASA, there are a lot of spin-off. The materials mm -hmm. they develop for their spaceships, same material goes to the industry and is utilized by the industry. If they develop oh. some new software, wow. if they develop some kind of new software, if they develop some new gadget, they develop some new material, all this is ultimately finds its way to a market through the industry industries buy that stuff and they develop it, they commercialize it. This is uh, where we are backing. Uh, the efforts by the industry are very, very limited. That's one main reason why we only have about 6% or so of the GDP going into science. That's quite a uh, st uh, number for a country which is uh, claiming to be uh, a superpower or a global power, more and more such people like you, uh, academicians, uh, uh, and all the industries, industry should come in together to have a more evolved system. As you talk about evolved system, India is also now seeing to get host the India Olympics in 2036, where sports becomes an integral part of our, uh, our life too. Uh, you have now you have traveled uh, all across the world. Um, uh, uh, seeing and uh, and seeing how the infrastructure, seeing how the all the development activities of the Western world, and now uh, the world that we are in right now. Um, 
sports as an element and uh, sports also has a lot of science that goes into it now do we have enough of these sports science schools right now in india developing athletes or developing the infrastructure or developing the mental the mental strength uh, to exhibit our talent uh, i'm afraid no not as yet but i i, I can see that uh, with as you can see that a lot of uh, uh, during the last few years we have been getting olympic medals we have been getting world champions Uh, for example, Neeraj Chopra has been doing fantastically well. In lawn tennis, we have had very good performance. Uh, even in table tennis, badminton, uh, hockey, well, it's uh, it's a about in uh, uh, in cricket we are doing very well. India is doing very well in the sports now compared to many others many uh, years ago. Uh, therefore, I think generally we would say that sports medicine or sports uh, whatever you call it. medicine or whatever uh, that is definitely coming up but i think it's still still far from what it should be one of the serious problems will be doping doping oh. means doping i mean to enhance the performance taking steroid or such chemicals at band now this is another thing somebody takes an steroid it is not banned one can go ahead. one would be not caught second thing is if one uses a steroid which cannot be detected happens mm-hmm. sometimes in some countries that initially uh, they, uh, the dope is not detected but later when there are more uh, modern technology to detect that other people are caught so one thing is that doping tests should be taken up very seriously right from the beginning otherwise people will uh, enhance their apparent performance using chemicals Sir. second thing so is I, i would uh, the, the whole the science uh, the temperament aspect uh, within sports and how the preparativeness that comes into it and, and uh, how how important is is the the, the science temperament uh, uh, not just in sports but in our daily daily life as such the scientific temper that that usually the western world has Uh, that is it has evolved to what it is become right now are we catching up right now uh, india being the epicenter now the whole uh, oh. the temperament scientific temper uh, i i'm afraid that uh, even some of the scientists don't have scientific temper i mean <laughs> strong <learning state>. science <laughs> learning science or knowing science is different but i i'll tell you one interesting story niels bohr Uh, a very famous physicist and nobel laureate he used to have a, a magnet odd shoe magnet hanging in his house at the door somebody oh, asked yeah. him if i mean in in europe they used to believe that this brings uh, good luck so somebody asked uh, niels bohr but even you believe in these things he said no no i don't believe in these things but somebody told that even if you don't believe in it it can bring you good Okay. <laughs> so, uh, many of the many of the scientists are superstitious, but then we should also realize that uh, we are all made of sentiments, things as well as logic. Depending upon one's childhood development, based on somebody's experience, uh, one can be religious and very scientific at the same time. And I don't think one should always see a contradiction between. being religious and in being in science science uh, still doesn't explain everything we are far from understanding so maybe that earlier people did realize certain things without going into the uh, you know the mathematics they could directly realize certain but uh, we do not know as far as scientific temper is concerned i think it's very important for any because if we are logical we uh, are reasonable then i think many of our social problems will also be solved many of the problems reasonable and logical our social problems can also be solved that's a very interesting uh, uh, interesting way to look at things yeah we of, often tend to be uh, illogical I, about i will give you i will give you one example earlier the 
woman used to be plain if she has uh, daughters. Mm. Now, science has explained that no, it's not so. Woman is not responsible, it's man. Because that chromosome comes from the man. <laughs> so if somebody understands this science, yes. that this social disadvantage that a woman had would be gone. So it's, it's about how you balance with both societies, you know, uh, effectiveness. Similarly, during the time of COVID, people mm -hmm. who were methodical, who were systematic, they could avoid the contamination or, the, or contacting the disease. But people who were not, who were not organized, who were not following the principles of advice, uh, they could not save themselves. So society right. should know that following rules is very important. And this is one thing that science teaches. Second important thing that science teaches is uh, nothing is final. The basic difference between science and religion, one of the basic differences, between uh, dogmatic religion and science is that in science, if you prove something to be wrong and put up a new theory, science is a mm -hmm. This is not what happens in case of dogmatic religion. But right. when you take religion as something which is way of life, that tells you how you lead your life, then it becomes a People, uh, sometimes uh, when journalists ask me, uh, are people more uh, religious these days? I said, I don't. A number people are showing like uh, by putting on clothes of a particular color or by chanting mantras day and night or by using loudspeakers on the uh, places of worship. It's not the religion that you are spreading. It's only the show of religion that well, if religion was were really getting more and more into the blood of people, we would, we would see less crimes. We won't see so many rapes or thefts or murders and all. Religion was really on it. There's an interesting author who wrote a book called Ganesha on my dashboard. Um, and he says that, you know, in his own words, that we, have, we buy a new car, we take it to the temple, we get all the puja done and everything. But when we get in the car, we forget to wear the seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least, so, uh, uh, yeah. And that's where we are prone to accident. Uh, and when you're prone to accident, you're not able to save your life because just the fact that you're not wearing a simple slink seatbelt with all the equipment that you have on the earth and everything that you have, the puja, you have Ganesha on your dashboard, you have all the dogs, everything. But yet you just miss the simple fact that you need to... Um, or, Follow a certain right. uh, line, a certain speed, and certain uh, safety measures for you to travel from a distance to other distance. And we all leave it to God saying that he will take care of everybody. When you have so much of it in instruction manuals written, we don't tend to follow it uh, within our uh, society. Uh, yeah, these are things uh, um, which have to be within you, which should be imbibed you. Uh, and um, and you must have this uh, inner perspective about, about it uh, as such. I think science should also become a way of life. In one's daily life, one should have uh, definite you know, hours for doing certain, eating at a certain time, uh, eating at a definite time. So if one is systematic, that is also being said. Uh, when we often say that we tell people about science or wonders of science, we are not trying to make them in any society. When, for example, I every year I give something like 50 lectures and some at least about 25 to 30 of them are for the children, the young students. I am not trying to make them scientists. I don't want that all of them to become scientists. It's neither feasible nor desire. No society which where everybody is a scientist will survive. We need people from all professions. But what is essential is that every individual in the society should be scientific in that. One key example which I noticed in my conversations uh, and my time that I've spent with the Western 
uh, world and the, the Eastern world and the, the world in India is that uh, the most advanced countries in the world are very scientific in their approach or in their doings as such. They're very systematic, they're very process driven, they believe in technology, they believe the use of technology, they're all time bounded and uh, they trust uh, the, 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 science, the science and the temperament and, and the, the publications as such. Uh, both the, uh, if you see the world of Japan is so advanced in and automobiles, if you see Korea advanced in beauty technologies, if you see the whole European world, which has gone way ahead in terms of research and development and America, of course, being the center hub. They have, all these countries have been successful only because they've advanced well in science. They've advanced well in technology. They advanced well in missionaries. And that's how they've become uh, what they are now. For some of the European countries like uh, Finland mm -hmm. or Germany, I, I would agree with what you said. But I don't think that the percentage of people who are very scientific in the United States is really very high. Okay. I, I in fact, sometimes suspect that if you look at the average person, mm -hmm. an Indian may be at least as much scientific as an American. Okay. Many people there are still uh, very dogmatic. Many people still do not believe that Earth is round. In fact, oh. uh, yeah. yeah. There, there was a scientist by name uh, Limple. He wrote a book about age of Earth. And in mm -hmm. its the introduction, he wrote of an interesting anecdote. He said that I got a call from the court. What the court wanted was that he should go there and certify uh, that age of Earth is 4.6 billion years. And this is really true. The reason was that some of the people who were very religious, they objected to this fact being taught classes, their students, because their religion said otherwise. They said, we should not tell children that Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, because Earth did not form that much ago, and it took just seven days for God to make Earth, or six days <laughs> to make Earth, and seven <laughs> days was for the rest. Okay. The court case about so these such things. So I wouldn't say that uh, everyone in the Western world or most of the people in the Western world are very scientific compared to India. There have been surveys carried out in different places. And uh, I don't think people have turned out to be very scientific. Some of the basic things that they don't know whether uh, Earth, it's the Earth moves around the sun or is the sun which moves around. Well, so even this, this, this is a fact. Uh, but it's an interesting fact you're telling about the Western world. Um, as to how they are also being uh, misled with uh, information. Do you see this as a religious information or just information that is coming within the sources? No, many of them are very dogmatic and uh, they are not really exposed to real scientific information. And even that their life goes on because they don't have to produce electricity. Someone else who is producing electricity, electricity and supplying to their houses. Without understanding electricity, they can continue to use it. Just like we digest even without understanding the principles of digestion. So many people there are not really very scientific attitude. In India, unfortunately, uh, in the ancient times, we had very developed science and technology. I, I sincerely believe it, and there are evidences to show that. Uh, we have monuments, we have structures, and it's very difficult to imagine how thousands of years ago in India we could build such, how we could have such organized houses and colonies in, uh, for example, uh, or such civilization. So we did have them, but something happened. Uh, for example, I was uh, just very recently, I was in Nalanda. I was surprised to see the huge campus that Nalanda University had. I was told oh, wow. that in those days, there were 10,000 students there coming from all over the world. It was an international oh, wow. university. So at one time, we did have those levels. But something happened. I think it's not enough to have a shield. You should also have a sword. If a civilization so, has to survive. I have one inquisitive question about uh, the Ram Setu uh, the bridge. How true is it the findings and how true uh, uh, 
uh, of the information uh, that has been uh, spoken about is true. There was uh, a movie that was made recently yes. and people have watched it, but uh, just uh, your perspective about it. Uh, the people who uh, appeared on TV, mm. well, they were speaking with a twang. They were Americans. And they were speaking with that American accent. Uh, but I don't think they were the authorities in TT. Nowhere in any of those programs anybody explained how they found out the age of the material deposited there. Nobody, nobody gave any scientific. They said that the one which is at the bottom is younger and the one at the top is old. Now, <laughs> this is not the natural, this is not the natural uh, way of depositing. Because right. whatever get deposited below has yeah. to be older. And then Older. things come and get deposited over. That is a natural order. Yes. Those people say that here the order is reversed. That means this is an artificial stuff. Yeah? This is not a natural stuff. But they did, right. they did not any time say how they dated it. Somebody said radio carbon. Radio carbon cannot date. Okay. Okay. So there are many theories that wound around it. Otherwise, you know, by this time, things should have been very clearly sorted out. But I am not trying to suggest that this is not an artificial structure. I'm not trying to suggest this is an artificial structure or not an artificial structure. It has to be scientifically examined. And I don't think and it has how, been. And uh, the interest about, uh, 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 you know, the, so many... Uh, I mean, of course, uh, you uh, in Hindu philosophy we call it the the Dwapar Yug, the Treta Yug, and the Kali Yug, and you see the the hotel uh, remains of such. You also have found the remains uh, within uh, within Davan. Yeah. So uh, how how true is that fact that you know these things are av available uh, there as such? You see, these things uh, are still not very clear, but there are some very interesting facts about this. For example, people have found the uh, the reminiscences of uh, the remains of old culture near the ocean where Dwarka is. Yes, exactly. Dwarka. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one of those pieces was dated in our laboratory long back when Rao was uh, studying that. He was in the National Institute of Oceanography. But I think just one sample was dated, so mm -hmm. I won't take it that seriously. Of course, they made a big story out of it. But then there is an interesting thing that the time which is attributed to Dwarka, around that time, uh, Dwarka, and then the, that it was submerged. Mm -hmm. That was the time when the sea level went up. Oh, okay. okay. Really, this is scientifically problem. established. Yeah. This is scientifically established that around the time which is attributed to uh, or which is uh, coincided with the uh, submergence of uh, Dwarka, that was a time when sea level went up. Okay. So this can be a historical thing also, but uh, nothing is very clear. So there how, was one what interesting the time that this first happened, sir, into your knowledge? They say that it's about 5,000 years. 5,000 years. But, no. but uh, there is another interesting thing. Uh, I got a call some, uh, I think, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. I got a call from one Mr. Bhatnagar. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, I am uh, Pushkar Bhatnagar calling from Delhi. I'm the income tax, I think income tax officer or income tax commissioner there. Okay. Scared me. It scared me. The call scared me. I don't have that kind of money to attract tax <laughs> officers. Okay. Uh, but so I look, I heard him very seriously. Then he said that uh, you are the head, you are heading the radio carbon dating lab at PSIP. I said, he said, I want to send you a book of mine. We, I have just finished. And the book is about dating the Ramayana era. Oh. I was curious, how come somebody who is most likely from arts background and is an income tax uh, official, uh, how come he's... So he explained, then I received the book. And uh, at that time, to be honest, I did not really uh, go through it. I gave it a cursory look. And then later, around 2000... Uh, 12 or so, I got a call from another person. This lady was again an income tax official. She was a member of the you know, board of direct, central board of direct taxes. 
And she said that she is organizing a conference about dating Ramayana era. And would I like to attend that conference and present a paper? I said, I have not done anything about dating Ramayana. But yes, about we have dated cultures, Indian culture, uh, cultural artifacts, and I can talk about them and how it can be applied to that. So I went there. The conference was inaugurated by uh, Dr. Kalam. It was oh, a serious wow. affair. And wow. the basic principle, how they applied some very interesting thing for dating Ramayana events was, so I think it uh, interests everybody. Uh, this was initiated by Mr. Kuchkar Nagar, as I mentioned. What they did was, he looked up the various versions of Ramayana. Tulsi Das is Ramcharit Manas. He also mm -hmm. went through Valmiki's. Then he also went to Kamban's Ramayana or some other versions. So there are many versions of Ramayana available. And then he started looking there at different life events of Lord Rama. Bhagavan Ram ke jo alag alag time like when he was born, when he went to Guru's place, to the ashram, when he broke the vow, when he got married, when he left for the Vanvas, when he fought Bali, when he uh, fought Ramana, when was the, then he came back, so what time, all these events. And in the Ramayana, the interestingly, the position of stars and planets at the time of these events is written. That sky looked like this when Rama was born. When he went oh. to the Guru, uh, uh, Gurukul or the ashram, the position of stars. So this was the basic input. Now there is a planetary software available in America. It's been available free. If you put in these positions there, this hmm. tells you what time the planets and stars had this configuration. Oh. And it turned out that they were all in a sequence. So wow. Ram was born at this time, yes, this point of time. He went to uh, his Guru Vashisht at this point of time. At this point of time, he went to the uh, for uh, for Vas at this point of time. So they fell in sequence. Now I don't know. I try to tell them to sit with me, or I would rather sit with them and explain to me why, how they calculated whether the uncertainty is within the you know tolerable range at all. That did not happen, but their point was that these things happen in this order, and therefore Ramayana can be dated to certain. Now, not everybody agrees with that date, but now people are seriously trying to do examine. So, well, these are very nostalgic uh, uh, conversations, and which you just engross into a lot of these seeping into it, and uh, uh, also coming to the new age crisis that we have right now is is about climate change, climate change and energy, which are the biggest requirements for this generation. And you have been a, a speaker on, on, on various forums talking about climate change and energy as such. Do we actually, are we seeing climate change now that the, the whole uh, four degree temperature shift also, I was clearly inquisitive to, to ask you this question. There is this belief that the North Pole and the South Pole have changed a little bit. How true is that fact? Number one, climate change is, this is not imagined. It's real. Climate is changing. Uh, let me also explain the difference between climate and weather. Climate is the average of weather over 30 years. Climate doesn't change every week or every day or every hour or every month or even every year. Climate, when there is a, on an average, when there is a shift in the temperature or humidity or rains or whatever over a period of 30 years, like if you take this 30 years, another 30 years, another 30 years, and there is a increase or decrease, then we say the climate has changed. Otherwise, you know, morning it can be cold and even at daytime it can be hot. This is number one. Climate has indeed changed and the correlation of uh, temperature increase has been found and the evidence lies at the poles. People went there and they took out cores of ice from there, oh. ice cores from there. And they found oh. that the level of carbon dioxide was increasing. Okay. The oldest ice had highest amount of carbon dioxide concentration, and then it went on increasing and increasing. 
And this change is most uh, clearly visible uh, over the last 200 years since the industrial activity. So climate change is on an average, the temperature has been Now, whether this is purely due to anthropogenic effects because of uh, human activities, or there is some other natural or astronomical parameter, that is not very easy to set. But one thing is definite that whatever we are doing is not proving the situation. For example, the carbon dioxide level uh, was 260 parts per million about 150 200 years ago. And now this is more than 400, 415 parts per cent. So more than one and a half times, much more than one and a half. Carbon dioxide has increased, methane has increased, and this is evidenced in the codes in the codes. So this is one thing, that climate change is real. We are definitely contributing to it by pumping in a lot of heat into the atmosphere, by pumping in a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot of methane in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide comes because of our industrial activity. Our main thing is we are burning coal and oil. For generating energy, for generating electricity, we are burning coal, we are burning oil. Even today, world's uh, need for energy is uh, fulfilled mostly by coal. I think more than 80% by oil and burning. Okay. But India and China is not going to decrease in near future. Right? So these right. Uh, factors, now people think of uh, new alternatives, but again, uh, there are commercial interests also involved. For example, people say that if you go for solar energy, things will be very fine. Now, please tell me, if everybody goes for solar energy, what are you going to do with the solar panels 20 years from now? Oh, there should be... be Number two, when you use solar panel, and if you don't wash them thoroughly, your production will go down to one third or maybe one half. A lot of water has to be spent if you want to clean the solar panel. Either solar panels should be built which have some kind of a special coating, maybe with nanomaterial or something, so that the dust does not accumulate over time. So no such thing comes without any side effects. If you go for hydrogen, hydrogen is very clean fuel. If you burn hydrogen with oxygen, that is combustion, you are going to get water. That means hydrogen as a fuel is a wonderful thing. When you burn hydrogen with oxygen, you generate energy, your car would be running and you will not be polluting. But right. in the process of producing hydrogen, you would be polluting. Right. We have right. to look at these things from well, from well to the wheel scenario. We are getting the gas from the well and we are cleaning it. It's like uh, somebody said that electricity, if you use uh, electric cars, it's all safe. How are you going to produce electricity by burning coal? <laughs> it's one and the same thing. So right. it's not really, things are not really that simple. Uh, sometimes the commercial interests also come up. Uh, so one has to be very careful and we have to have a kind of a book, nuclear energy, uh, fossil fuels, uh, wind energy, solar energy. And also, we have to invest enough in science and technology so that we build gadgets which consume less and less of. I have another. Yeah, please, please finish. And we have to change perhaps our uh, living style. Today's children, they set the temperature at 20 degrees, then they cover themselves with a blanket, and then they, you know, they shiver, but they are happy. And that means wasting a lot of uh, electricity. So you also spoken about artificial intelligence uh, and how it's going to define uh, the usage and the next generation. Um, are we are we right now living in the world of AI right now? As we get to speak to each other right now, uh, driven by a lot of technology over Zoom and uh, YouTube and, and, and the internet era. Basically, uh, what we say intelligence mm -hmm. over. 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 years of our lives, we are being constantly programmed. Right. We know if we touch a hot plate, our finger will burn. 
Right. We program ourselves, not the fact. Right. Look oh, at something wow. which is greenish. Mm. We and we slip once. Tai agar kahi bhi hai, slippery. And we so next time we look at something like that, we we have, we program ourselves that we are not going to step on that. Or if we do, we do it very carefully. This constant programming of ourselves is evolution of our intelligence. Basically, we are programming ourselves. And if there is a computer which is being programmed, and the program is being written by us initially, but later, if that computer program can evolve itself to artificial intelligence, and that is where it uh, um, there is also. This is what people sometimes say that one day artificial intelligence is going to take over us. Now, I was talking to an IIT professor. He said, no, as long as we consume uh, the final product, we will be the boss. I think this is true that uh, our intelligence, a computer can process things much faster than it. But we have a unique ability of parallel processing. And this parallel processing makes us unique. Is nothing stopping uh, us from making a computer in future? It will also be doing equally good parallel processing, and the speed of it will be much higher. So uh, I have no doubt that, as far as speed is concerned, overall a computer will prove to be much faster than us. Their storage of memory is going to be much more than us. But then that element of creativity may still take a lot of time. Okay, but just like we are programmed, computer can also be programmed. So I think it's only a matter of time that uh, they will the computers will be as good as. So they probably call be called humanoids, <laughs> the way that it's. We're going to see that world, and this was something which I I, mean, I watched this movie called Star Wars uh, way back in 1998 as a uh, as a young guy, and uh, there were interesting facts about people going on the Mars. The whole flying machines. I see them happening right now. That you know we're able to fly in the air. Uh, uh, we're able to transcend boundaries, and you know uh, the whole robotic experience are, are actually coming true uh, to human life as such. So maybe in another 10, 20 years, we must probably see a humanoid accompanying us in our homes uh, and in our workplaces and every, everywhere as such. I wanted to ask you this interesting question, which I had in in me is how was your experience meeting Dr. Kalam, a legendary figure that he is, and uh, and you have worked with him, and of course Dr. Rao as well, Sienna Rao. Your both experiences uh, sharing the dyers and 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 work with them. Uh, I have worked. My guide was Professor M. N. Rao, not Professor Sienna Rao, but I have okay. met Professor Sienna Rao. I have okay. met him. Uh, he's different. I mean. I am nobody to comment on his, uh, you know, capability. But he is a very bright a person. In fact, I remember there was a magazine, and it published an issue, and uh, they said who is going to be the next Nobel laureate uh, from India. Okay. And many of them, including Professor M. G. K. Menon, said that Sina Rao is going to be the next Nobel laureate. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but at least that shows that the you know kind of uh, uh, battle he has and the kind of uh, now, uh, Dr. Kalam, I didn't work with him, but I have interacted with him. I have met him several times. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a program in Parabalki. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he was the chief guest there, and I was among the organizers. And I anchored that uh, appro approximately one hour function. And I that was uh, then later, uh, the book of the conference. I mentioned that uh, we had a conference in Delhi, which was inaugurated by him. For the release of the book, we went to his residence, and there uh, we met him. And he was very, you know, chatty. As soon as I told him about my radio carbon dating background, he started oh. in uh, Saraswati and all. Uh, then again, uh, in uh, 2011, uh, it was 100 years of a GIC at Basti. Mm -hmm. So those people somehow got wind of the fact that I knew Dr. Kalam. But they approached me and they said that uh, we must invite him to a bus seat, a small place in UPs. I helped them and finally we were able to bring Dr. Kalam to Basti. So Dr. Kalam was there and there again, as soon as his PA told him about me, he said, oh, bring him, bring him. Because he heard PRL and he had been at Sro. PRL 
is the mother institution of so he immediately started that and uh, so we interacted quite a then uh, in PhD again uh, he was a chief guest I was a uh, post side I was uh, chairperson of the committee I interacted with him. he is uh, but still I cannot claim uh, you know that much of intimacy so I asked one of his colleagues uh, one engineer and Mr. Avasti who was worked with him I asked him, what was it that made Kalam so special? Because <laughs> if you really look at it, it was not a PhD. Contrary to what many people believe, he was not a PhD. He was not an MS. He had done a diploma in engineering, or a BSc in engineering or something. But he was not a, you know, a properly trained scientist then. So he said, uh, Mr. Asti told me that he was a fantastic project leader. I asked oh. him to elaborate. I said, what do you mean by saying that he was a fantastic uh, athlete? He said, if we ever had any problem, we would go to him and we will tell him the symptoms. And like, an, like a very good doctor, he would think and then he would say, okay, go and try that. And most of the time, diagnosis used to be cut. But more than this, he had another side to his personality. He was a good human resource manager. He had a sensitive side personality. For example, I read somewhere uh, that a scientist was working with him on a very good project, very interesting project, very important. So Alam Tahab asked him that today, uh, please finish this work before you leave, which would mean that he won't be able to leave before 10 p.m. That <laughs> is how, you know, people work in ISRO and such organizations. There is uh, nothing like working hours or working days or any such thing. Now, that fellow's uh, facial expression told Dr. Kalam that something is, you know, the usual work or enthusiasm for work was missing. Let him go. Then he asked his one of the other colleagues, said, what's wrong with this guy? I told him this and he wasn't very enthusiastic. He said, actually, today is his uh, kid's birthday and he wanted to go to home in the evening so that he could celebrate his birthday. So, you know what happened? Hello. He did not relent. He still made him work till 10 p.m. And when that scientist went home, he, he saw that everything was already completely prepared for the birthday. They were decoration in place. They were a cake. And so he was wondering how it happened. Then it turned out Dr. Kalam had set another officer whom he could spare that day to go to his place, take his children to the market, buy all the necessary things, make all the preparations for the birthday celebration. This is something unique, and I think this, uh, this, unique uh, this is something unique about him. But he was sometimes, he could be very strict too. Asked him in uh, Barabanki that uh, the host institution has requested me because I was anchoring the program. So uh, they requested me that, can we have these many programs by our children? I said, you know, it will be small visit. They say one welcome song, one dance, one uh, another play and all these things. So Kalam Sahab said, I am going to stay here for 60 minutes. I plan to speak for 45 minutes and 15 minutes for those children's performance. If you want to give them 45 minutes, I will speak for 15 minutes. Okay. I said, we're limited. <laughs> we said, right. okay, we are sorry. Uh, only 15 minutes for the children's program, 45 minutes, Dr. Kalam. So, how uh, he goes. So finally, as we come to the close of this uh, wonderful uh, chat show, uh, the Zena Star Salon, your final message for the viewers of the show about scientific temper and science and technology and advancement uh, for the next generation. I would tell everybody uh, that it is not essential to become a scientist. As I said at the beginning, neither desired, nor feasible, nor good for the society. But everyone should be scientific in thinking. Logical in thing. If you are logical, immaterial of this field you are working, you will find this to be very, very helpful. And it does not mean that it stops you from being spiritual. But your attitude in even in social matters, it should be logical and uh, there should be reasoning. Many of our earlier religious practices were actually scientific in nature. During Corona, people understood the importance of quarantine, which right. was practiced in India 
most of the people used to die either natural death or because of uh, infection. And therefore, for 12 or 13 days, the person who was attending to that man was kept isolated from isolated. other people. That's which would right. affect. There are many yeah. practices. The com combination of food that this yeah. thing should not be taken in combination with this. Uh, right. All many of these things are scientific. But over time, many things have you know have been corrected. Many practices have been corrected. So today we do not know whether the pumpkin is poisonous and which pumpkin is. <laughs> so we have to be very careful. Uh, but I think uh, for society, it will be good if people are scientific. And uh, for the young people, my message would be that if you are interested in science, don't be, you know, uh, attracted by higher salaries or big car or facilities and all those things. If you are genuinely interested in research and if you are creative, please go for a career in science. It's not really that bad, even in, ter in, in financial terms. And if you really love science, go for it. You will love it. And your life will be happier than earning, you know, mega million. Let's hope that everybody's life is happier with the practice of logical thinking, scientific thinking, and more advanced way of looking at life. Thank you for your time on this weekend episode of Zdena Star Salon, the chat show with me, Kapil Dev. That was Dr. Chandra Mohan Nautyal, wonderful personality all the way from Lucknow. Until the next time, with the next guest on our show of Zena Star Salon chat show on the Zena platform. It's me, Kapil Dev, on the weekend, saying goodbye, good luck, and namaste. Thank you, Kapil Ji. Thank you, Zena, and everybody. Patient. And think now. Rajiv bhai, kya hua? Hello. <laughs> Let me call him. So we'll just leave from here so that yeah. He will he'll get the final come. So that was a nice talk, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank, very, thank you. Very soothing. Covered a huge spectrum. Yes, yes. I mean, it's very difficult to cover everything. And uh, we have actually spoken a whole lot of topics in, in one hour. <laughs> I hope this for... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this one thing actually was clear. Good. Voice was clear. Voice was good. Voice was good. Voice was good. Voice was good. You already are in the practice of speaking, so we don't have we don't yeah. have to tell anything. <laughs> yeah, but you know, sometimes the it's the, yeah. Sometimes the net, you know, we we'll never know about the net. Yeah. So what we'll do is, okay. sir, we'll just leave the podcast, so he will sort it out. Yeah, I'll get you okay. on the phone, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for so your time. Much. Pleasure, sir. Thanks. Bye bye.